everyone. We are live on the Frugal Crafters YouTube channel. I have Sarah here with me. Hello. And we are going to paint this um, tea and tulips um, little vignette, little still life. And Sarah had a great idea. She said, oh, a Mother's Day uh, project. And I'm like, huh, that's a great idea. So paint up a couple of these. You know, you can get, get some good practice by Mother's Day. Your, your mom or mother-in-law will think you are just... Uh, just awesome if you give them a picture of this. Uh, my practice piece was done on some inexpensive um, Aqua B watercolor paper. So um, this is about how it would react on a less expensive paper. The Aqua B paper is 100% cotton though. So I like that, it, you know you're gonna have an archival paper even though it's less expensive. Um, it's not really, it's not gonna like degrade in a frame down like years down the road. So um, perfectly fine to use whatever you have, but this is just an example on a less expensive paper. This video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. I'll be using the Turner watercolors today and I had run out of my uh, set of my original set of 18 and uh, so I got the set of 24 and I'm going to show you that set really quick. I really think the set of 18, the, the smaller tube set of 18 is, is the way to go to start if you like the paints because they're a lot less expensive. Um, but even if you do get into the realm, these are huge tubes. Um, this set is more expensive, but the tubes are really large. There's 24. Um, most of them are single pigment colors, and um, and they're going to last you a long time. But I would definitely start off with a smaller set to make sure you like them before you invest uh, the money in the larger set. Um, the only disadvantage to the smaller set, I would say, is there's not a strong, cool red. So if you get that set, I would plan on purchasing like a, a tube of quinacridone magenta or quinacridone red something or a permanent rose something really uh strong and cool because their reds tend to be warm they do have a mayan red and that's cool but it's kind of weak so that would be my only uh my only warning on the smaller set is just you're gonna want another cool red i have the a pattern um linked in the video description and also a uh, link to the reference photo as well as all the supplies we're going to use today we are going to be using um mimic brushes from creative mark uh, and there's also a coupon in the video description for Jerry's. It's a bit not applicable to everything. Some things are on sale or some manufacturers have restrictions, but it is um, it is a good way to save if uh, if you want. doesn't hurt to try it anyway. And um, we'll be using the tried and true Mimic, uh, Mimic squirrels that we use a lot. And also I have the Mimic Kalinskis, which I actually used these before I had the squirrels. I like these better for quite a long time. Um, and I do think these are a little bit better if you're getting started in watercolor because they have more of a snap, which means they spring back a little bit quicker and they're a little firmer and they don't hold quite as much water. So if you have, if you're using student grade paints, these are going to work better for you just because they're a little bit firmer and they're going to kind of kick up the pigment a little easier and they're not going to hold so much water that you feel like you're watering everything down when you're working. So um, I just uh, you can see those in action and see if that's something that you might be interested in. We're going to start, um, we're not really going to start by wetting the background. We're going to be um, kind of painting um, bit by bit around our, um, our or still life here. I feel like I haven't talked in like three days. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I was very, very like last minute today and I was thinking, boy, today's Jason's last day at his, at the, you know, the working for the man job. And I was like, today would be a day that if I had an extra set of hands, I'd be like, okay, scan this and clean it up. Instead, I'm just like, you know, throwing it in the machine, doing a quick scan, you know, just to, totally could have used extra, extra set of hands today. Um, so Next week. Next week, I'll actually week. have have a have a professional operation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna mix up some gray. I'm gonna use cerulean blue, which I don't think we've ever used cerulean blue in a tutorial. Definitely not in a live stream. Um, it is a slightly cool blue, uh, not super strong. It's a, a nice sky color too, and I'm adding a little bit of burnt sienna to that. And we're gonna end up with this nice soft gray. I'm gonna shift my palette over a little bit because that was out of screen, you can see it right here. I'm using my um, my tin that my core paints came in as my palette uh, because what I did was I took my, I took half pans and put my Turner paints in there and full pans and I put magnets on the bottom uh, so that I could just save a little space in my desk basically and have some more options. And then I'll show you how I store my paints. Um, all these little random pans, I keep them on this side and then I just bring over the ones I'm using in a painting to this side so I don't get confused with all of the different pans that I have there. So I recommend doing that if you have a lot of paints so you don't end up um, getting mixed up on what you have. I'm going to start with a shadow on the table underneath my plate 
and I'm going to wet just with clear water the um, that area under the plate and this is going to help me get a diffused fade on my shadow and this paper I'm working on here I really enjoyed that uh, paper I used last week it was a Winsor Newton professional 100% cotton and I was worried that they didn't make it anymore but I found it at Jerry's so um, of course if they make it Jerry's will have it and they'll probably have the best price so I did link to that if you're interested in this paper uh, you want to get the professional line if you are looking for the 100% cotton somebody said they have a student line that's got a synthetic blend to it which um, which probably would keep it from wrinkling a little bit and I just um, sketch this on with a regular mechanical pencil so if you see my line smudge that's why it's not really going to cause a problem and then I'm going to take that I'm going to blot my brush take the extra water off my brush and grab that gray I just made actually I think I'm going to add a little more blue to that because I feel like my gray is a little too warm and I want a cooler shadow under there so a little bit more blue and I am going to concentrate my shadow more towards the raised up edges of the plate so that's where I'm gonna put my color and then I'm gonna pull it in towards the middle and you can see it's just kind of bleeding out on its own and that's what I want it to do and I'm gonna bring I'm actually gonna wet over here as well if you have too much flow then just kind of rinse your brush off blot it and then drag your brush under the uh, shadow that's a little too bold and you can kind of um, pull away some of that paint but it's not going to leave a streak because your brush is drier than your paper so that paint and water just wants to soak up into your brush and then you get you keep a really nice soft line there all right so i'm going to wet this area now under these tulips and the shadow is going to be super light because the tulips are higher the those leaves are higher off the ground they're not so close to the um, area where they're casting the shadow so they're going to be much more diffused and much lighter and then what I'm going to do is blot any excess water off my brush this is the number eight round and I have a confession to make um, I have a problem leaving brushes in water and I love these brushes and the reason that I hadn't been using these and I switched to the Mimic Squirrels is because I left these brushes in water for a weekend. It was after one of the live streams. I think I, one of our first live streams and all the paint chipped off and came off and the ferrule got loose and I felt so bad. Um, uh, so I, that's why I switched to the other brushes, but I ordered a new uh, number eight, and number 16. <laughs> now, those are the sizes that I used all the time too. <laughs> Did I interrupt you? Were you going to ask me a question? No, not at all. Oh, so yeah, that was my little, uh, <laughs> I was so upset when I did that. <laughs> but I bet you haven't done it again. Uh, let's say no. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I just get distracted and I went downstairs today, uh, to get some, to get my watercolor paper and I go down there expecting to see a nice pristine area, but I forgot I made a card yesterday. So the place looks like a bomb went off. It's awful oh my word it looks like somebody just ransacked the place looking for money or something I don't know I'm gonna wet the cup here but luckily I actually like cleaning my crafty area because there I is there is a lot of satisfaction when you're crafting area is kind of a mess and you get it cleaned up and organized yeah because you can listen to a podcast or oh, yeah. put some videos on yeah. i i like to watch other people cleaning their craft room while i'm cleaning my craft room i love watching like those those cla those craft room declutter videos and i haven't seen any of those oh they're wonderful i do a lot of podcasts when i'm doing stuff because i can't if i if i put like a video on i get too distracted and i stop doing what i'm doing so i'm better off listening to a podcast i think i listen to more videos than i actually watch i i like to have something on mm. i like the chatter right no i mean that pod that, that's why i do the podcast because i can just put you know i can set the speaker down on my phone and then move about but if there's any sort of video i'll stop and i'll start watching i'll get sucked in for 10 minutes at a time which is not efficient that's your survival instinct though that's like scientists or anthropologists say that that's what we're wired to do so we don't get eaten by predators and stuff that's true so 
I do a lot of podcasts. That's safer for me. I, if I mean, I watch videos, but I plan. I'm like, okay, I have. I'm eating lunch, so I can sit down and watch mm-hmm. a video or whatever. Yeah, me too. I will watch if I'm if I'm eating. I'm taking some yellow ochre and some burnt sienna and I'm mixing it together. And the burnt sienna is just kind of kicking down the yellow cast. Now, another pretty color to use in this case would have been Naples yellow, and I'll just show you that pan. However, I didn't choose Naples yellow because I didn't want to add another color to the mix, and Naples yellow is less versatile because it contains white and is more opaque and less strong. So if I wanted to mix with other colors like the greens for the tulips, um, it wouldn't give me, I would just wouldn't have as much versatility, and I think it would be a little foolish to have two colors so very similar. Uh, in the same project. So I'm just, I added a lot of water so I could use the white of the paper to lighten it up. Uh, Baru Siva, Lindsay, do you still use your Coom sharpener for pencils? Is it good? It's very good, but funny story with that. Um, I lost the the little guard that went on it and uh, I, I think it went in the trash when I was like dumping out the shavings at one point and I looked and I I couldn't find it, so. I, I need to get another one, I guess. I'm kind of bummed because I really like that sharpener. Uh, Bryn Friel, do you ever wrangle watercolor paper on a roll? If so, would you recommend a 140 pound aqua bee for practice? I have never purchased watercolor paper on a roll because I, I never paint larger than 22 by 30 inches. And I usually paint much smaller than that. So I'm usually tearing down my paper to like quarter size or this is an eighth of a size sheet. Um, so it's not, it's not practical for me. So I haven't, and sometimes I, you know, it kind of feels like an ordeal sometimes to tear down the big sheets. Um, and I'll just do it in the evening. I'll, I'll tear down all the sheets that I want to, like that I'll use for the next six months. Um, so I haven't gone by a roll, but if there's anybody in the chat that has, maybe if Steve from Mind of Watercolor or Denise Soden from, um, uh, in liquid color there. Maybe they could help. I haven't seen them, but that doesn't mean they're not here. You, you can pop over to their channel, see how I volunteer them. You can go over to their channel and ask them. they probably <laughs> tell you. <laughs> tell you all about it. Outsourcing. I'm outsourcing already. I'm going to be totally ready when Jason joins the team. <laughs> <laughs> Denise and uh, Steve will be happy. Oh, finally. You stopped sending people over here. <laughs> That's not true. No, they're pretty good. Um, I'm going to mix some phthalo green with cerulean blue and this makes a really pretty turquoise it's not too um unwieldy uh these paints dry down really well a lot of people ask about that like do you need to add honey do you need to add glycerin and you do with um student grade paints but these dry down just fine um you haven't had any cracking i just poured these last weekend so they haven't been drying for too long but they most of them except for the quin magenta have dried down really well the quin magenta is still a little moist uh, but I know even with my my old palette, I hadn't uh, added anything to them. Uh, Eve's bolt says uh, she's not user roll, but they're not great. It's hard to flatten the paper and cut it without creasing. Oh, I bet that's difficult. And it seems like there's not that much of a cost savings. Like if you buy a sheet, you're getting. You know, for the aggravation of dealing with a huge sheet of watercolor paper, you're getting a cost savings over blocks and pads. But I don't, it seems like the roll, you're almost paying more to get that larger sheet. I bet it's more difficult to produce. I just mixed up crocheting and knitting. <laughs> <laughs> you oh know, no. You can tell how often I've done it. Oh. Oh, and that will make people get seriously upset about mis- mixing no, up crocheting and knitting. No, even Grace are teasing me because they're like, Sarah, uh, you use hooks, not needles. I'm like, well, <laughs> see how good I got it. <laughs> uh, Baru Siva, have you used Camlin Kukoyo Professional Watercolors? No, I've never heard of that brand. It's available on Amazon. I haven't. Cheap for them. <laughs> I haven't. If anybody has and wants to weigh in, uh, go ahead. It seems like there's a lot of uh, mater- new materials available nowadays. I want to do, um, I think I'm going to go over and work on the tulip heads because they are, um, they're not touching anything that's wet currently. So I'm going to go ahead and wet those first. We're going to do our first wash. 
uh, Sky. I can't seem to find black watercolor paper heavy enough for watercoloring. Any suggestions on what brand or where to buy some? Um, because watercolor paper is, uh, watercolor paints are generally transparent. I, they don't make any black watercolor paper. However, you could, um, you could get like a black pastel board. Um, that would be, you know, on a board and you could use that for like gouache or you could, if you're using gouache, you could, um, get some acrylic gouache and paint a board black and then go over that with your with your regular gouache as long as you were going to protect it somehow afterwards um, because it would probably want to flake off if you don't, if you don't put anything on top. It, it would definitely be, be uh, susceptible to moisture. But I, I mean, there's some companies make a toned paper. It's not very popular uh, because when you're working with watercolor, the whiter, the whiter your paper is a color. And, um, and when you have a toned paper, it really dulls your colors. It's effective for some situations, but, um, but it's, it's not as popular for that reason. But I would try pastel board. You probably use your gouache on that. So for this uh, purple color, I'm actually gonna uh, switch to a smaller brush so I don't end up with too much water. You wanna mix your quinacridone magenta and your cerulean blue. Even though the cerulean is um, on, slightly on the green side, it's still going to make a really vibrant uh, purple when mixed with quinacridone magenta because it's magenta is such a strong color. You will if your paints aren't completely dried down like mine aren't completely. I mean they're pretty close. I want to rinse in between colors so I don't contaminate, which isn't a bad habit anyway, to be honest. I'm enjoying cerulean. This is a color I don't, uh, I don't typically use. It's not as useful as phthalo blue, but um, but it's a nice addition after you've had your basic colors for a while and you've gotten your practice in and you want something different to play with. I'm throwing it in first where I have sketched in the divisions of the petals. And I'm using a small, um, well, it's probably like a, a number two round. Now these brushes are a little bit better if your paper is more textured because they do have that extra bit of push to them. And these are the, um, the Mimic Kalinskis, which are animal friendly because they're not real Kalinsky. I feel like I have to say that because uh, I got a nasty comment. I was oh using God. the Mimic Hog oh brushes. <laughs> Send them my way. I'll tell them what you think. They won't bother you again. <laughs> and I'm going to spread some of that color around with a larger brush. But it's kind of nice to concentrate that color on the lines and then you uh, just kind of spread it around with the other brush and you keep that little bit of detail. Oh, I forgot to say, if you guys have a question, probably the moderators have said it already, just type the word question in all caps so it helps Sarah catch it when it's going by. And uh, then she can, if the moderators don't answer it, she can relay it to me. I'm gonna add a little bit more color towards the base of the flower. And then we're gonna use our credit card scraper to scrape in some uh, dainty veins. And remember, your colors will dry a little lighter. So if it looks a little bold to you, it will shift a little bit. Now the wetter this is, when you do your scraping, the uh, darker the lines you're gonna get. As it starts to dry and you were to scrape, you would get more uh, lighter lines. It would actually squeegee the paint away. And also the sharper your tool is, the more you're gonna get a dark line, the duller your tool is. Like if I use the corn, like the rounded edge of this old credit card, I would get a lighter line. It would wanna scrape it away um, as it started to dry. But if I use the tip of this, it wants to give me a, a skinny dark line because it's scribing the paper. It's kind of kind of like cutting it a little bit. And I'm gonna to need to let that dry before I go on and do anything else. I'm gonna lift that up to the camera a little bit and just so you can see those, uh, those really fine lines that I scraped in there. 
Okay. And now we're going to move on to, I think we'll move on to um, these little chocolates in here. I think they're like little wafers. They look like little chocolate wafers. Like Nutter Butters. I think those mm. are, is that what those are? Those Nutty Bars? Well, I see they, in the grocery the nutty store. Bar, the nut, those are, well, Nutty Bars are the long rectangles. Yeah, things. that's what these look like. They, I'll show you the photo. They look like Nutty nutty Bars. They got the little waffly texture on the mm, top. Delicious. Always one of my favorites. I haven't had those in forever. Oh my gosh, me neither. That's like a summer camp. Like, your mom would pack you that in your lunchbox. We... We would get those once in a while. It was like a treat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'd have to buy them ourselves. Because you they, back in the day where you could get penny candy, they'd always have like the individual Debbie, little Debbie snacks. Oh, yeah. That too. Yep. Was those or the banana twins were my favorite. Oh, I don't remember the, the banana Debbie's. twins. Oh, so good. I used to like the 10 mm. cent Jolly Rancher bars. I don't think they make those anymore. I don't think they make those either. No, you can get the little hard candies, but not the bars. The bars I, are awesome. I haven't seen the bars in a long time. Mm. I'm mixing burnt sienna and yellow ochre, and it's just giving me kind of a... It's going to give me the lightest color of these wafers. Um, it almost looks like a quin gold, actually. And we're just going to do a wash on these three um, little cookies here, candies, whatever they are, chocolates, nutter bars. Mm -hmm. I always like the Swiss cake rolls. I wish they made those vegan. I never got into Swiss cake rolls. I have friends that used to eat them all the time, but I was never a Swiss, Swiss cake roll fan. I never liked the devil dogs. I mean, I'd eat them if they were there, but they were always so I dry. I never liked the devil dogs either. I, they were never one of my favorites. I like the, there was like these pastries, I think they were called like pick em ups or something, and they were like, they had like this cream and like this jam in them, and they were like really flaky and oh, delicious. Yeah, yeah. My I mother always had those. Yeah, I don't know. Nutter, the, the Nutty Bars and the Banana Twins were my two favorite. I don't think I ever, I don't think I had the Banana Twins. Oh, you, well, you couldn't find them just, they weren't everywhere. Mm. You could only get them at certain places, but it was, you know, moist banana flavored cake with like a vanilla frosting in the middle. Ooh. So it was kind of like a devil dog, but better because the cake wasn't dry and it tasted like banana. Mm. I always like the smell of like Twinkies. Yes. It's such an amazing but smell. I was never a Twinkie fan. No, but they smelled so good. I want, like, Twinkie perfume. I would totally buy it. <laughs> That's such Twinkie a good perfume. smell. It's so, no, it smells so smell, good. You don't smell like cake? It smells so good. I would. I would totally like to smell like cake. Oh, I, have, I have friends that, like, cake smelling things. I'm like, I don't want to smell like dessert. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to try to move her over to the uh, tulip leaves here. I think I'm going to hit it with a dryer, though, really quick, just so I don't have any unintended, unintended feathering. So if you have any questions while I'm drying, it's a great time to, uh, to fire away. Or we'll just talk about cake some more and everyone will be hungry. <laughs> I actually found a uh, stash of candy <laughs> left over because I, I couldn't fit it in, uh, in Christmas packages and stuff. And um, I found this stash key. Oh, my husband's listening. This isn't good. Uh, so I gave it to the kids oh, before Jason got home. From all the candy out. <laughs> I told the kids to make it disappear. Go away. <laughs> I know. I was like, what's in this bag? This is like a shopping, like a cloth like, shopping bag. I put it here? Oh, like, oh, candy. Stuff that did not fit in the packages. <laughs> I still have a ton of candy left over from Christmas. I've been slowly making my way through. I typically don't get too much candy, so well, I don't really I have a problem either, with it. Whatever is reason this year, I got a ton of candy. Huh. And I don't, but it's fine. I don't eat it. I was like, I'm not going to have to buy candy for the rest of the year. I've got all of my chocolate supplies until from for now until next Christmas. Or I have, I'll buy it and forget that I bought it, and it will just sit, you know, until somebody else finds it. Yeah. I mean, mine are right in the pantry, so I see it, but I don't, my sweet tooth isn't crazy. Well, it is around certain times of the month, but then I, I always have the good chocolate, so I only need a couple of pieces yeah. and I'm satisfied. I have a salt tooth. Oh, yeah, salt. <laughs> I, yeah, salt and, and fat. Oh, yeah. Carbon. Potato chips. Oh. French fries. Oh, home cut like the hand yeah. cut french fries crispy with a 
boatload of malt vinegar on it. Oh yeah, that's the stuff right there. Magic. This is a mixture of permanent lemon and yellow ochre and thalo green. Oh, so I had another question that I thought was, I hadn't thought about this, but um, I don't know if the, if the asker was trying to be snarky or not, but it was actually a really good question. Um, they they asked, how come you never mix greens? You know, like it, it almost came across like a, you know, what kind of oh, artist do you don't know, how, don't know how to make green? Um, but then it, it occurred to me that, cause I, I'm like, I mix almost every color that goes in my painting is a mix. But then I, I, the reason that I don't go with like yellow and blue typically to make my green is because uh, you can get greens that are single pigment that are going to be more vibrant than mixing a, a yellow and a blue. Uh, thalo green is an, is an example of that. Pigment green seven. It's an extremely intense color on its own. It's almost um, it's very unnatural looking. However, you mix it with a yellow or an orange or brown, um, you can get some really gorgeous colors. Mix it with um, your quin quinacridone magenta, and you get this beautiful deep eggplant color. So that's why um, a lot of times I'm going to start with a phthalo green and mix it with a yellow ochre or mix it with a lemon yellow or I'll take a sap green and use it straight from the tube out of convenience. Um, it's just because you get a little more versatility and with a phthalo green I'm going to get more vibrancy than I will with um, mixing like my phthalo blue and my lemon yellow. That will give me a fairly vibrant green but it's not going to be quite as um, as vibrant as starting off with a, a single pigment green. Because it's not, uh, it's you definitely should learn how to mix your colors. Um, but color, the the colors you're getting in tubes are not made by mixing your colors always. You you want to look for colors that are single pigment because those are going to be more vibrant. Even if they're a secondary color, there are secondary single pigments. Once you start mixing, every every mix, every color you add, you cut the vibrancy. So I hope that makes sense. That was a very good question. Whether it was meant to be serious or not, it was still a very good question. <laughs> the chat quiet today? Oh, no, it's good. Just not a lot of questions. Ah. Oh, I forgot to draw the little... Um, a little stem on one of those tulips. Let's see if I can find a pencil here. I dropped one. That's gonna break. Um, I just need to put the little stem off of this guy here because we can see it. And I want that because I want that stem to be kind of light, so I wanted to make sure that we could see that. And actually, we should have a little bit of a not a stem, but part part of a leaf in there, so. Grab some more of that really pale stuff. We're going to be layering, so that's why we're starting off really pale with this almost chartreuse, chartreuse color. Actually, I'm just going to fill in this area because we will be glazing over that. Yeah, and we'll grab some phthalo green. Actually, I'll put it there so you can see it a little better. And some more lemon. Clean your brush between those two colors because that thalo is really strong. Uh, and the yellow ochre. So I have this kind of like pea soup color. I want it a little bit darker. I'm going to go in with the thalo again. So your colors don't get too watery. Just blot your brush in between, like after you rinse it. Okay, and I'm going to start this color um, kind of back here on dry paper. I'm just going to add in where I want those darker shades, and then I'm going to go in with a wetter brush and just kind of spread it out. A lot of times when you're working with... Um, like a cotton paper, you're going to notice that one side is a little bit rougher than the other and you can use whichever side you want unless the manufacturer specifically says that it's only sized on one side. Um, the uh, This paper appears to be sized on both sides, so is arches, so you can pick the texture that works best for your projects. Now 
Yeah, I'm going to mix a little bit more of the lighter colors in there, the other yellows. I just knew that whole, um, that whole leaf is fairly dark to begin with, so I didn't want to just start with a lighter one when I knew I was going to have to darken it up afterwards anyway. Now, phthalo green is a staining color. Any, any of the phthalo cyan colors tend to stain, so you just want to, um, Keep that in mind, so I'm trying to keep that edge wet as I go so they don't end up with any harsh lines. Anytime you have a really transparent, vibrant color, it's going to stain more than a earthy color. And I'm going to go ahead and grab some of that color and do that last little bit there. And then we can let those dry and we can glaze over our shadows. Beth Roberts, does Lindsay plan to review the Shin, Shin Han watercolors? I have been, I've actually had them in my, um, in my cart on Amazon for probably two years. Um, I haven't heard very good things about them. Marty Owens at OwensArt.com, and he's also on YouTube as Owens Art, has a review of the Shin Hands. I actually asked him when I was considering buying them, and he really said that, uh, he said, I'm not a fan of the Shin Han. <laughs> so a little <laughs> funny rhyme there, and that just stuck with me. So I haven't ordered them. I really uh, kind of respect his, uh, well, I totally respect his opinion. And um, I was like, boy, I just don't want to, even though they're not that expensive, I just didn't want to throw money away, you know? And he's got a great review on his channel. Uh, go check it out if you want to see them in action. That would be my recommendation. They have a couple of lines. They have um, they have what they call an artist line, but then they have what they call a professional line, which is a lot more expensive. And I certainly didn't want to go with a professional line at that price because it was like, I think it was over $100 for a little set. Um, and I don't know what, what set he had. They have a, a cheaper set that's around $27, but still, I still don't want to throw away $27 just on idle curiosity if, you know, somebody that I respect already told me they're not that great. Um, so I would definitely check out his review. He's very thorough with his, um, with his reviews and I, and I trust his opinions. So I, they're still in my cart. If they like drop suddenly in price, I might grab them. But, uh, at this point I'm not, I, I'm not willing to spend, to spend the money on the ones that I think might be crappy, but I'm not willing to spend the, the big bucks on the ones that may possibly be decent. Uh, Natalie Bowers, what's the advantage of cotton paper over other papers? Uh, cotton paper, um, the probably the biggest advantage is that over time it won't yellow and discolor. Um, but for the short term, for the actual painting on it, the advantage is that instead of the the paint beating up and just sitting on top of the paper uh, and drying at different rates, um, your paper gets kind of absorbs the water and stays uniformly wet longer. Where you have a cellulose paper, you're going to have spots that dry out quicker on you. And also the sizing... Um, on the, uh, it's not as absorbent, so the sizing will keep some areas of your paper really wet and puddly, and um, some areas will start to dry out and you'll have hard edges, which can be a really cool look um, sometimes, but it can be very frustrating if you're trying to spend a lot of time on an artwork and um, and build up layers. So that's like that's the working advantage, and then of course the archival quality is the long-term advantage. So to make a super dark chocolate for my cookies here, I am going to go with my darkest colors first. I am going to grab some phthalo blue. I'm sorry, phthalo green. I'm just going to mix it here because I've already mixed it once just to test out the mix. Then I'm going to go with magenta, which is its opposite. Or near opposite, not perfect opposite because it's going to make a like an eggplant purple color. If I spread that out, you can probably see. I'm going to add some burnt sienna to that. I'm going to blot my brush off. I want to make sure I don't get too much water in there. Now, if this is too orange, which I don't think it is for chocolate, but if it's too orange, you could add some purp some uh, blue because blue and, op and orange are opposite. And I'm going to go in here and add some of the darker areas, and I'm just going to spread it out with another brush.
I'm working on the dry paper. I switched to a smaller one too. That's a little big for where I'm trying to get in. I think we'll go with the number four mimic squirrel. This uh, paint that I'm putting in now is quite a bit more liquid, so it's going to dry lighter. I like to kind of um, point my brush towards the edge I'm trying to make smooth and just kind of wiggle it along. This, this paper is uh, a little on the rough side. I, um, I think I'm going to sketch it on the back side of the paper. And I'm just spreading out some of this, leaving some areas a little bit darker than others so that I can have um, some kind of uh, cast reflections that are coming off the plate, making some areas a little bit lighter. And don't worry about perfection because cookies and things like that that are handmade should not look like they came out of a mold. They should be imperfect. Chewie's resting her head on my foot. <laughs> She's keeping it warm. She is. She's like fuzzy slippers. I had a lot of requests for uh, uh, people want to see Chewy. Uh, yes, I saw. I'm mean, pretty sure that picture I put up is still still there on the page. Is it on the is it on the live show Frugal Lights page or I, the Frugal I, Crafter community? I think it's on the Frugal Crafter community. I'll have to double check. If not, if I can't find it for some reason, I'll post another photo so people can see her. Yeah, I could put it up in my blog. That, yeah, that would be, and then you could do that. Yeah, tag a photo of Chewy, and then anyone that's curious can find the post. Yes. Because she's awful beautiful. She can be. So when she was trying to eat poop all night the other night. Oh, that's bad. That's naughty, she Chewy. She me when I told her not to. Oh. <laughs> she's dog. She can't help it. I'm going to grab that same color while I have it on my brush and I'm going to go into these um, candies here and I am going to kind of just paint in like little shadows. I'm basically um, trying to get that little waffle texture in there. I'm just kind of painting around where like the raised lines would be. Do you have any videos of your your actual painting and workspace? Oh yeah. Okay, I thought so. Someone was asking. Yep, just uh, if you, I have a whole storage playlist that has all the craft room tours on it. Oh, there. You, Cynthia, Cynthia Deering was asking. She's trying to put something together and looking for ideas. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a. If you go to my channel and you go to the playlist tab, you'll see the storage playlist. Or you could just um, go on my channel and, or in my. Actually, if you go on my blog, you'll be able to see photos, which might be a little more useful for you. Um, but just Google craft room tour or storage or art room. Any of those keywords ought to get you where you're going. But yeah, I usually post a tour every year. I've been on YouTube for about eight years now. So there's quite a few there. And I might even have had a uh, photo uh, version from before I did YouTube because I had my blog longer than that. You can see how the space has evolved. <laughs> you can see how my, how my hoarding problem has progressed over the years. No, no, you've you've clamped down on the hoarding problem, though. Yes, I have way less this year at this time stuff. than I did last year at this time. Which, if you walk down my room right now, you'd find that very hard to believe. But it's all just. Well, mine's. I mean, I same thing. I've been cleaning stuff out of mine. If you walked in and saw my jewelry table, it looks like jewelry and packaging just threw up all over the place. All it takes is one project <laughs> to make your storage go awry. I'm just kind of wiggling my brush around, getting some texture on there. Okay, we're going to go back to the mug and mix up a little bit darker of a color. We're going to start again with a phthalo green. Uh, Bev Roberts, would it be corny to add some swirls of hot vapor coming from the teacup? Oh, that would be cute. Go ahead. You're painting, you do whatever you like. You might need something and you might need a background uh, for the swirls of vapor to show up. Like if you had like a, just a background wash and then you kind of like wiped out the swirls with a paper towel or a Q-tip or something. 
I'm going to add a little bit of yellow ochre to this as well. Oh, there, that's a good color. And I just want to add some kind of like drips in the pottery glaze. Uh, Judy Doyle, how are your pans sticking to your palette? I have magnet dots on the bottom and I recommend magnet tape, but I just happen to have dots. So that's what I used. And I didn't want to buy something new where I had them, but I'll flip it. See, just a little magnet dot. I think I need a little more water in my mix. It's a little darker than I need. I'm just adding kind of like little drips of the glazing. Dancing Hamster, have you used Canson watercolor paper and how does it compare to Strathmore? Um, I've used, you know, both of those companies have different lines. So, um, I've used like the Canson watercolor cards and they're, uh, very much like the Strathmore watercolor cards. Um, I've used the Canson XL paper, which is, um, one of their lower end student grade papers. It's, it's nice. It's just not very good for, for a lot of layers and a lot of robust work or it will eventually pill, but I use it mostly for, um, like if I'm rubber stamping and I want to use watercolor markers or watercolors, on my stamped image, it's perfect for that, or watercolor pencils, uh, but it's not quite robust enough to do um, like a like a, a painting like this. It would just start to wear out, start to pill, the surface just wouldn't be able to handle the washes. Um, I've used the Canson Montville, that's really nice. That's probably like the next step up. It is a wood pulp, so it, um, it eventually, you know, will would kind of break down on you, but it it holds up pretty well for pretty big washes, but you also have this situation where it's going to dry a little unevenly. I haven't used their Heritage line, which is new uh, and more expensive, but I bet that's kind of more like Arches because I think Canson owns Arches now, so it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of labeled a um, an art paper um, with very similar technology. I'm mixing up a little bit more of that same color. In Strathmore, I don't care for the Strathmore 300. I like the Strathmore greeting cards, um, watercolor greeting cards. I like this, the Strathmore 400 that's got the, um, the brown wrapper, the brown paper. And I've used Strathmore, Strathmore has some specialty papers too, like um, Aquarius 2, which is partially synthetic. That's a really fun paper to play with. It does, it's, it's fairly thin, it doesn't warp, but it's not as slippery as Yupo. So the, both those companies have so many papers that it's hard to say, well, Canson's better than Strathmore. Um, there's, you know, you have to kind of compare it apples to apples. What about apples to peaches? It doesn't work that way. That's what, that's what it's like comparing. It's like comparing apples to peaches. I like peaches better. Yeah, me too. Hard to find though. Not they are, season. they have to be in season. I'm also, I haven't been eating fruit, so. Cutting out the fruit, except for berries. Berries are good. I am a I am a major fruit fan. I eat a lot of fruit. I eat a couple pieces of fruit every day, probably. But I have no reason not to eat fruit, so. Well, I mean, because I would do, you know, fruit when I was doing the six small meals a day that people do. And I would have a piece of fruit, you know, like you're supposed to for a snack. And, you know, an hour later, I'd feel my blood sugar crashing. I'd get hungry. Mm-hmm. No, I just, I don't eat it because I don't usually have it with meals. I'm not really snacking, so. I have it with meals. I have it with lunch and, and uh, right. breakfast. I don't snack. I'm a three meal a day person. My stomach gets upset if I snack too. I don't, I can see how you get that, that crash. Yeah. I will have a cup of tea though. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'll do that. Tea or water or even coffee, anything, that's fine. Nothing, would, but I just, I like having two or three meals a day. Yeah, this is healthier. Sometimes one, sometimes none. Sometimes I fast the whole day. You're a better woman than I. It I used to practice. do the fasting. Yeah, I used to do like the juice fasting. But no, that's, so that's not calorie free though. That's... No, no juice fasting. Like this is just water or tea or coffee. There's no juice. There's just straight fasting. Wow. It's very, it's very freeing. 
Yeah, I guess you wouldn't have to spend all the time cooking or no fixing cooking food. I hate fixing food. You don't have to worry like, okay, well, what am I going to have for lunch or what am I going to have for dinner? How many points was that? <laughs> and you're just like, I'm not eating anything today. I'm just having, you know, water or coffee or tea or whatever, and it's great. I took a little of that shadow color and added it into the um, inside of the mug just to help it break apart a little bit. And we're going to let that sit. Oh, you know what? We could do a little bit of uh, yellow ochre in there, too. Yellow ochre or the burnt sienna, so it's not super yellow. Might even throw a little of this uh, brown that we made for that chocolate in there, too, just to take down the yellow a little bit. Add a little bit of that violet in there, maybe. There we go. And you can adjust the intensity of how, how dark you want your cup to be. And you can put a pattern on it if you want to. I would just try to keep it fairly subtle. I'm just adding a little bit of this brown kind of around some of the glazing drips. There's so many pretty glazes. Little flecks of things in them. How many people do we have in the live today? We have 342. Great. Okay, let's do some glazes on the uh, the stem, the not stems, the leaves. We're gonna go back to our greens here. I'm gonna add a little bit of cerulean into that. It's gonna cool it down, darken it up. And I am going to add this on the inside here of this leaf. Make sure you don't end up with any um, puddles because if you have a puddle, it's gonna dry and give you a, like a harsh edge. And I'll make that a little bit darker. Oh, I wanna show you a really nice dark color that you can make. We're gonna do the, um, the magenta and the thalo. It gives us a super, super dark eggplant color. That's gonna be handy to mix into our greens when we want a really, really dark color. See, when I mix it to a green there, it goes almost to like a Payne's gray color. And I'm gonna add some of that in there. And I'm gonna add some of that up here at the tip of this leaf where it's kind of folding over. So this, that dark is going in the, uh, like the leaf is kind of cupping around, so it's going in the in the inside where it's being shadowed. I'm going to take some of that color and add it in the inside of the leaf here. And if it doesn't end up being as dark as you want it, you can always go back when it's dry and add another layer. And we're going to go in this one as well. Just gonna try and make sure my lines are nice and smooth. If I have any rough lines, then I'm just gonna um, smooth it out. Even if it ends up making that section I'm working on a little bit wider, I'd rather have a smooth line. And I can go right up next to this flower here. Rinse my brush, add some of that uh, green that I mixed, and then fade it out with that color so it uh, gets a little bit lighter as it goes out away from the darkest area. I'm gonna grab a little of that darker mix and bring it in here. Contrast is uh, how you get that nice depth. And play with your darks and your lights. Just make sure to um, fade out your colors. If you know you want to fade them out because of the uh, phthalo green is going to be a staining color. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm 
I'm grabbing a little bit of that uh, three color green we mix, both yellows and our phthalo green, and add that in here as well. And I do want a little bit more dark up next to the chocolate area where it would be kind of recessed and a little bit darker. I'm going to grab some of the yellow, I'm going to grab some of the both yellows, yellow ochre, lemon yellow. I should have cleaned my brush off before I dipped into that lemon yellow. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> add a little bit of that there, add a little bit over here. The yellow ochre, actually any yellow tends to have a little more opacity than, um, than other colors, so you can layer over with yellows and actually bring a little bit of a lighter quality back. Clean up that yellow. There we go. And I'm going to mix up a little bit more of that green that we're using. We're going to start with our lemon. We're going to grab a little yellow ochre and some of the phthalo green. Pretty color. This is how stingy I am. See these little bits of paint? These are like, when I first got my core colors, I squeezed them out, but it's like, I still have a little bit there. I don't want to waste it. You know, it's like, you know, I got full pans over there, but it's like those little scraps of color. It's like, I don't know what you call that. Too frugal, maybe? I don't know. No, you're not wasting. That's good. One of these days I'm going to need that much transparent brown oxide and I'm going to have it right there, ready to go. <laughs> I think I want to um, scrape in some of the um, veins on the, the leaves too. They have a subtle texture, just really long uh, lines. And you really see it in this back leaf. So I'm just trying to put some really fine parallel lines down. Just try to go to the contour of the uh, the leaf here. And if your paint sat a little bit, you might end up with some lighter lines. I'm getting some light ones and some dark ones, but that's all right. I think it, it adds to the texture and looks all right. And if you feel like you want more lines to show up, you can gently go over the area with just clear water and it'll help the paint settle in to some of those grooves. And I'm going to grab some of that green. And I think I'm going to layer a little bit on top of this because that feels, I'm just going to glaze over this whole area because that feels too yellow. And that unifies both of those shades. And I think I will also glaze over this area here to deepen it all up because all those colors could use a little bit more deepening. And a little on this guy back here. And I think I'll go ahead and do the ones in here as well. And add a little bit of yellow ochre to that stem portion though. Rebecca Corvo, if you do the scraping and then glaze again, do the dark veins disappear? No, no, they'll actually they'll actually take whatever you put on top, they'll they'll grab some of that as well. So there, that's permanent. When you do the scraping, it's it's going to be apparent no matter what you put over. Because you've actually damaged the surface of the paper and that will always show up. So now I want to do a glaze of some burnt sienna pretty much on its own over the chocolates there. I might throw a little bit of this purple in there. Just give it a nice mid-tone. So it's pretty runny. It's kind of like um, skim milk consistency. Milk, it's a 
don't have to drink it. You just got to paint with it. Oh, uh, yeah. I, don't, I remember when mom switched, when I was a kid, you know, mom switched to skim milk. Mm-hmm. It was supposedly better for you. Oh, I never really got into it. <laughs> it took me a long time to drink it. I can imagine the consistency is something because, like, I don't like almond milk because it's so watery or rice milk because it's so watery, but mm. I like soy milk. I don't have very much, but, like, in a uh, cup of coffee, I like skim, uh, not skim, uh, soy milk because mm. it's just richer. Yeah. And I like strong coffee, but I like to, I like to make it strong and then throw the soy milk in it. And it's fortified, so I know I'm getting my B12, B-complex vitamins. I just drink my coffee black. It's a lot easier. I like my my coffee experience to be very tasty and comforting. <laughs> and I get that with the uh, with the soy milk. It's like having a little cup of dessert. Well, I mean, I, I'm not, I, but I don't, John, John won't drink soy milk. And I don't drink things that require milk yeah. or of any type. So... I don't, I mean, I just keep drinking it black because I, I wouldn't use up anything I bought and I ended up dumping the majority oh, yeah. of it down the drain. I'm going to mix up uh, some more shadow color because I feel like the shadow under the plate should be a little darker. Um, I'm using cerulean blue and burnt sienna. Cerulean blue is a little bit more um, opaque than ultramarine. Even though ultramarine has a little bit of, of opacity because of how uh, chunky the pigment is, um, this is a single pigment, PB36. It's just got a little more body to it. If you look at the color, it just has a more of a, a solid quality to it. And it's not as strong tinting wise. I need this to be a little bit cooler of the, for the, under the plate. So I'm just, I want it to make sure it's not really blue looking, but I want it to be cool. So I find that like when I spread the paint out thin, and then I can see the thin veil of color. I can tell whether I've got it cool enough or not. I feel like I need a little bit more blue still. There we go. And your eyes will adapt to that. You'll learn to tell whether a gray is neutral, cool, or warm, just the more you paint. And if you have markers, uh, if you have a lot of markers or colored pencils, chances are you have some of these blues. You might have a, a line of cool blue, uh, I'm sorry, um, cool gray, warm gray, French gray, which is kind of a warmish gray. Um, and then you can kind of look at those and even swatch them out and that might help you train your eyes to see what, you know, what the undertones are. All right, so I'm re-wetting this area and I'm doing this so I don't end up with a hard line. I could go in and put the color and then spread it down. Sometimes that gives me a really harsh line where I already have a, um, a wash under there. I don't want to have a harsh lines, so that's why I'm wetting it first. And I'm just kind of dropping the color where I want it to be a little bit more intense. I'm letting it fade out. And I'm going to wet and uh, clean and dry my brush off and just kind of Drag it across the center so I can remove some excess. Everything we're doing in this painting is really quite subtle. And I want some more shadow in amongst the uh, cookies here. And I'm going to go in with my smaller brush. You can use any of your smaller brushes. You might want to mix that paint back up again. Sometimes your pigments will separate a little bit. Just give them a little stir, especially if you have a really watery mix on your palette. And this time, since I don't need to, I don't have a big area I wanted to spread in, um, I'm just going in and painting that. And I can soften the edge a little bit if I need to. Bring it right up to the lip of that, the edge of the lip there. I probably should have taped my paper down. It is buckling a little bit, but I don't think it'll cause me any problems. So I did have a question that I thought was really good about how to, or what to do with your, um, 
with your painting if it buckles. And this one actually came in my classroom. And what I, I have done a couple things. Usually what we'll do, the trick is just to, um, is after it's all dry, just to put a heavy book on it and leave it overnight. That usually will flatten it out. And when you go to frame it, any little bump like that will just go away in the frame. You won't, it, the frame will keep it flat. Um, if I've had a really tricky painting where it's gotten really out of hand, like maybe I painted it on really thin paper or um, a student grade paper, what I would do is I would flip it over after it's completely dry, spray the back, and then I would um, weigh it down. I would put it down on something like waterproof and I would put a pieces like a wax paper on it and put a book on it and then as it dried it would flatten itself back out that's not something I like to do especially if like the, I spent a lot of time on it but that's something that would happen more in the cheaper papers and it's generally uh, a paper I wouldn't spend that much time on it so that would that's a solution that I've used for that and I've even ironed my paintings mm -hmm. in fact ironing it might be like you'd flip it over you'd iron it from the back but put a piece of like taping paper over it um, and that works too and if it doesn't work on its own you can give it a little light mist of water and then iron it but again I would only do that on stuff that you're not completely um, you know in love with but it's a it's a good solution I am going in with my that same mixed purple that we did with the cerulean blue and the magenta and I am just redefining the separation between our petals on our tulip. I'm gonna blend out the area here in the center. And anytime you add a glaze over these tulips, if you've scraped them, it's going to make the veins a little bit darker. I think I shut the you did. cellar door. I don't think she can go anywhere. <laughs> She's just hoping. Well, because there's a there's a new girl that started working at the daycare that she goes to. Oh. So, you know, I dropped her off and we introduced ourselves. And as I was walking back to the house, I was like, oh, I never told her that Julie figured out how to open the gate. <laughs> so apparently she learned the hard way, too. We went right over and opened up that gate. And oh, of all course. And all the other dogs free. New person. Yeah. I was like, well, she's either been told or she's going to figure it out. And when Ron <laughs> picked her up, apparently she said, I've never seen a dog go so fast for that gate. <laughs> I bet she did. All right, so now we want to do some um, just final darkening and details on our like our little cookies there, and then we can decide whether we want to add any um, color pencil or anything to our finished piece. Hmm. You're fine, Joey. We'll in a few minutes. I'm really liking having my colored pencils handy. I put them on a shelf. I can actually show you what I have them in. They're in a spice rack. Um, I think I, should, I, had a, I posted a picture of this on my blog the other day. Watch me drop the entire thing and that would be so sad. But I put a, a, this old spice rack and I put all my uh, my Prismacolor color pencils on one side and my Spectrum Aqua watercolor pencils on the other side so I can just grab a pencil whenever I need it. And I'm using them so much more because they're convenient. So if you have that situation where you like, you, oh, I wish I used this supply or that supply more, it might just be a matter of putting it somewhere where it's really convenient for you to use it. I'm just pretty much glazing over with this warmer brown. It's burnt sienna on its own. And I feel like the little cookies could use a little more color. I'm just going to grab some of this brown mix here and add it to the bottom of the cookies and I'll blend it. Because it looks like it's kind of like a vanilla chocolate cookie. Uh, Moon Ram, what can you do and not do on B paper? I think she means the aqua B paper. Um, you know, you can pretty much do anything you want on it. It doesn't have quite as much sizing as arches, but I'm able to scrub and scrape and um, 
that sort of thing. It just, the, the main thing, the main difference I find is that the finish doesn't seem as bright on like if you're doing straight watercolor. Um, if you're going to add mixed media to it, like I did on this, I did add some color pencil to it. So it's nice and that looks nice and bright. But I mean, it's not, it's not that different. It's just, it has a little bit less of a luminous quality. Although this is like a, the aqua bee is super bright white. So that doesn't make it look a little brighter. It's, it's just a personal preference thing. I happen to like arches a little bit more, but I would say you could do pretty much everything that you want to on it. Um, I think I'm gonna add a little more dark to the darker cookies and then I'm gonna give it a dry and then do some colored pencils on it. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you wanna think of them, just um, let Sarah know while I'm putting these final details and drying and we can, uh, we can answer those for you. Um, Mary Birder, can I substitute Dioxazine purple for Quinn Violet? Uh, you probably, qu I've heard Quinn Magenta, which is way more pink. Quinn Violet, you probably can. Um, it, the Quinn Violet may be a little bit more pink and a little bit more vibrant. You add a little, you probably need to add a little bit of um, Thalo Blue or Ultramarine Blue to it. Thalo Blue if you want to have it super, super transparent. Ultramarine if you want, um, if you want it to granulate a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't see, well, you can definitely mix from that. Even if it doesn't give you an exact substitution, you can mix it. All right, let's dry this up and then do some pencil work. Uh, Rosemary Carlson, I was curious about Rembrandt's transparency. I do not like its glossy to finish. Is there anything wrong with it or should it be like this? Um, in the pans, the Rembrandts look a little glossy, but I don't find the the painting the paintings to look glossy at all. It could be you're using the paint really thick, and that's why you're getting a bit of a gloss. Um, I haven't had any issue, experience when I'm painting with watercolor using the Rembrandts as a traditional watercolor. I haven't had any sort of gloss on the paper. Just the pans look a little glossy. So I would say add more water. If, if you're using it so thick that it's glossy, then you're you're um, you're using it almost opaquely, and you're using a lot more paint than you need because it does rewet pretty easily. And I could see how it would be easy to get a lot of paint off those pans more than you intended or needed. I hope that helped or answered. I'm gonna grab, I have a little bit of uh, French gray, which is a warm gray. This is French gray, 70%. I'm gonna use a very light touch here. And um, my pencil's not very sharp, so that will help me get just a really, really light uh, shadow. I'm using barely, like, no pressure. Just tiny little circles, just giving a little bit of shadow to the edge of this mug, kind of just behind the front lip. and then the edges. Uh, I'm gonna take some of that uh, down next to the cookies and the candy. I typically don't like uh, go in and sharpen my pencils to alter watercolor because I'm generally just um, doing some very light shading and nothing too intense. If I was going to go in and put some big detail in there, I might want to sharpen stuff. On watercolor paper, it being so rough, you are going to get a very broken um, line. But since you have the color underneath it, it doesn't really um, cause a problem. And usually when I'm going to add pencil, I'll keep the pencils that I'm using out just so I know what I've used already. And I'm adding a little bit of light umber to the edges of the vanilla cookie portions here. And that's gonna help with the texture of that cookie that I want. I want it to be kind of pocked. Someone was asking me about Martins. I was like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> How do I explain Martins? How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Oh. Go in. With money, because if you find something, you better buy it. Because you'll never you see it again. You go in the next day and it will all be gone. 
But you should probably go in with cash and not a credit card because you could get into some trouble. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> but then, yeah, you don't know because you might find something totally awesome and you'll wish you had bought exactly. it when you saw it. And that's the thing. You need to... <sighs> I like Martin's, but I have to make sure I'm in like a, a hunter-gatherer yes, type of mood. Yes, you have to... to be in Martin's mood. And what a friend of mine says, and you don't do Martins and Walmart in the same day. No. One or the other. You'll, you will have decision <laughs> fatigue. Uh, Lauren Lentini, do you recommend a daylight LED lamp? I feel like I need a large, consistent light source for painting. Um, You know what? I have an alt light, and I hardly ever use it. Um, I like the I like the daylight lamps. I don't necessarily think they need to be LED. If you know that's what you want, then go ahead and get that. Um, I have C daylight CFLs that I really like, uh, and I have them. I have four of them over my table here where I'm recording. But if I'm just painting um, and I'm not recording, I just use one or two. But I need the extra light for filming. Um, I think whatever you get should be daylight. I don't think it has to be LED. They're more expensive. Uh, it depends on how long you're where you're gonna run them. I guess. Uh, I don't think the CFLs cost that much more to operate, and they're a lot cheaper to buy. But I don't—I don't personally don't care for the alt lights that much. Uh, Trisha Hank, if you did a background wash, what colors would you would you suggest? Um, I would probably do. Uh, I might not use the same colors if I knew I was going to do a background wash because I like to use. Um, Colors that lift a lot for background. I'd probably, out of these, I would use the yellow ochre, cerulean blue, and the burnt sienna because those would be my most liftable colors. I'm highlighting the uh, the tulips a little bit, like on the edges, just to give them a little pop. And I'm going to grab some yellow, some kind of a lighter, creamier yellow. And we're going to add that onto these um, these uh, flower um, leaves, rather. That will help brighten up and warm up any of the green. If the green's got a little cool, which is really easy to do with the uh, phthalo. <laughs> what are you laughing about over there? Oh, the pine cone crafter. I through the Martin's jingle. I bought it when I saw it. <laughs> Martin's. Do you have any big Martin regrets? Did you ever did you ever pass something up and then regret it? I haven't. I haven't. Do you remember the time they had like all the Anna Griffin paper and scrapbooking stuff there? Yes. Oh. Yes. There were uh, many. But I, but I also I usually only go about once a month. Yeah. So when I do find something there, I'll buy it because. I don't go there often. <laughs> yeah, I can't go there too often. I can't go, it, it's funny, you don't really want to go there with something specific in mind because, you know, you have to go there with a very open mind that, you know, you never know what you're going to find. And I, and like you said, you have to be in the mood. So, yes. you know, when I'm, the mood strikes and I'm in Martins and I see something, I put it in the cart and I buy it. So I haven't ever bought anything that I've got and been like, oh man. I mean, I bought I bought something and I had to return it because when I went to use it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. But they gave me my money back. Oh, they're they very good. You know, yeah. super good with returns. I'm using some dark green just to um, darken some of the shadows around the objects here. I see, I have a problem with if, if it's a good deal, not only do I want to buy it, but I want to buy it in multiples. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, especially something like Sometimes you can get like really good like winter socks or mittens yep. or hats and with kids and stuff. It's always good to have multiples. Or when you lose stuff, scissors. They had these scissors once and they were like, I don't know, 70 cents or something. And I bought like oh, probably 20 pairs of, yeah. of scissors. Yeah, like, but what? you always need scissors. I know, but I was better keeping track of the scissors that I had. I probably wouldn't need to buy 20 pairs of them. But I was thinking, well, I teach, so, you know, yeah. I always need scissors. I No, I have multiple pairs of scissors in my junk drawer so that they can be used for paper or plastic or zip ties or sheet metal or whatever John feels he needs to cut <laughs> instead of using my 
scissors from my knife rack. Or your fabric scissors. Uh, the fabric scissors are not anywhere where he can find them for that <laughs> reason. He'd have to go into my craft room and start hunting, and I know he's not going to do that. I have a piece of ribbon on my fabric and ribbon scissors, so the kids know. Don't. Don't touch them. Touch. Jason knows too, but he likes to pretend he's going to wrap presents and use my fabric oh, scissors. Oh, he thinks it's funny, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, I just realized I'm using dark green to shade these uh, these little candies, and it actually works pretty good because <laughs> of all the red in that brown. You have to be careful. The color pencil can be kind of addicting, and if you don't... Uh, if you don't watch yourself, you could end up just redoing the entire thing in colored pencil because it's really fun to uh, to use. Grab a little bit of this purple color. This is called Dahlia Purple, and I'm adding that any place I put the darker uh, purple. And that will also catch the texture of the um, of the scraping that you did. It gives you a little extra texture on those helps bring them out a little bit if you want all right and I just need a little bit of highlight on those little nutter butters or whatever the heck they are I'm looking for a nice light warm brown that's not quite dark enough I might actually need to get a cream we'll try this color this is called sand Ooh, it's a barrel Prismacolor. This is a moldy <gasps> oldie. This is like from the... It's a vintage. Early, sure wanna, early 80s. You sure you want to use it? Save it. No, I'm not I'm not curating an art supply museum. <laughs> they want to be used. So, I don't know if you saw on Facebook, I got an issue of a Scientology magazine in the mail. Yeah, I saw that. I posted it in case it disappeared. I was like, they need to have an avenue to check out. Because I don't understand why I got this. And the name was Smoky Coffin. That is so weird. That's a great name, though. So I told, I said, <laughs> I know, right? So I sent the picture, because John was on, was on base. So I sent the picture to him, because we were just talking about powder day. And he's like, well, you win. And he said, don't worry. I'll make sure your craft supplies go to a good place. A good home. I was like, you're not funny. <laughs> That's funny. I've never had a Scientologist come to the door. Well, oh, but it was mailed, wasn't it? I don't it? think they do. And I've never, the only thing Scientology related I've ever done is I watched the Going Clear documentary that's on Netflix. I mean, that's the only thing. I've never gone on the internet and looked them up. I've hmm. never contacted, so I have no idea where it came from. Maybe Freak somebody signed you up for that as like a joke or something. I guess, but like... I don't know who would do that. That wouldn't be, like, a friend. Hmm. That's definitely strange. I mean, I know I've pissed people off in the past, but I've never gone by Smokey, so that's the weird... It sounds almost like a country singer, doesn't it? It does. Smokey Coffin and the Wild, Wild Ones Band. Yep. That is weird. It is. All right. Just, uh, you know, you can add, I would try not to add too many colors to it, but, you know, you can, like, I'm taking some of this brown and adding it to the mug because I think it helps give, like, the appearance of the flex in the glazing. And um, any of the colors that you've that you've been using along, anything you can find in the color pencil that's fairly close is going to work really well. Um, and it does give you a nice, you know, depth of color, and it's it's quite honestly just really fun. It's fun to play with your with your colored pencils. And it just it, it's nice, I think, because it picks up the texture of the paper, and it just um, I just like the way that looks. I like I like seeing that little hills and valleys and specks and sparkle of the of the uh, paper tooth. That yellow okra will be pretty in our, in our tulip leaves, too. Do you have any other questions before we wrap it up? Let me scroll to the bottom. 
you guys can hang out in the chat and, and chat afterwards. I think it's, as long as you keep the browser open, you guys can carry on like uh, any conversations and stuff you're having for a while. I don't know if, I don't know once you, if you don't close your browser, how long it stays active, but I think it's there for a while. Uh, M4DC40, have you ever tried the Pro Art range of brushes? Well, there's a couple different companies that go by the name Pro Art. There's an American company and there is a um, British company. And um, I have used, uh, my friend Rich, the spin doctor, sent me a couple of their Proline Pro Plus brushes, which are, they almost feel like a golden tacklon, but they're shinier. Um, and they're a very snappy, springy brush. They didn't shed. They seem to be, uh, seem to be quite nice. But those, those are the only two. I don't think they're that common here. We have a company called Pro Art in America that I don't think is affiliated. And they do more um, like children's art supplies. I mean, their their quality is fine and everything, but they're definitely more of like, um, you know, like the chubby brushes for like easy grip for kids' hands and stuff. Uh, that's more of what they offer. And just like studio, like like class packs for teachers, that's the kind of thing that they offer here. So I think they're two different companies. But I, what I tried, I liked, but I don't really have a lot of experience with that brand. All right, well, that wraps it up. Um, I'll show you this compared to the one I did on the Aqua Bee. I have to say, I think I like the Aqua Bee one a little bit better. And that was that like really cheap paper. Certainly not that much difference. So, you know, use whatever your budget allows and you like the feel of when you're working on it. Um, this video is brought to you by Jerry's Artorama. I have all the supplies linked up in the video description. I'm not sure if they sell the Aqua Bee paper. I didn't link that up, but um, they probably have it. It's in a six by nine inch uh, pad. It's, well, not even a pad. It's like a package and it's like 50 sheets. I, and I think it's under 20 bucks. Um, and I, Jerry's might have it. If not, I think your, most of your big box stores would carry it, which is odd because usually they don't carry the <coughs> high quality, inexpensive stuff. It's usually the mediocre quality, you know, <laughs> uh, stuff, you know, <laughs> generic stuff. But, um, but check them out if you're in need of art supplies and there's a coupon code in the video description. And again, I use the Turner paints. Uh, I have all the colors and stuff listed, except for the colored pencils. Use whatever you have that's closest that, you know, gets a job done for you and whatever brand you have. When you're just doing like finishing touches here, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's such a small portion of your of your painting. Um, it's it's really not that big of a deal what brand you use. Light fastness, of course, is an issue with colored pencils. But again, you're using such a small amount. I don't think it would really um, affect the light fastness of your painting because you have most of it's done in watercolor and those pigments should be light fast if treated properly, which means framed and matted under glass. There, any questions? Are we good? We're all caught up. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much for painting with us today. I hope you have a really good weekend. And until next time, happy crafting. Hopefully I'll be here next week if I don't get kidnapped. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs>